So next up uh, will be the um, really the Viennese secessionist movement uh, in in Austria in Vienna, Austria, and we'll start with uh, the the origins of that by Otto Wagner, the Stadtbahn entrances. Uh, these the Stadtbahn is their subway system in Vienna that was. You know, being newly created in the 1890s, and uh, Wagner, a very um, prestigious architect, established architect in Vienna, was hired to create the entrance pavilions. You know, where you would walk in and then descend down into the underground subway system. And so Wagner is is, as I say, was already a well-established architect by this time, and had worked in you know, probably more neoclassical forms up until this time, but he he was an early adopter of this Art Nouveau, you know, arts and crafts movement uh, in the 1890s and created these subway entrances that um, made the style quite popular. In Vienna, we call the Art Nouveau secessionist movement, and this is um, refers to the idea that the artists and architects that began working in this style seceded from the more traditional art guilds and architecture of the era. And so they uh, began to really actually call themselves secessionists to, to separate themselves literally uh, and figuratively from the established art and architecture world. And Wagner was one of the founders of this movement. So here is one of the most famous, uh, the Karlsplatz entry pavilion and we see the the you know typical characteristics that we've been talking about in both Brussels and even a little bit with Gaudi's work uh, especially you can see the, the iron column here in the center and a little bit of organic capital of leaves and vines at the very top we see what appear to be almost like leaves or vines stretching across the fascia of the arch and of the capitals or the columns on the sides there There's a detail of that. So we have the stenciling on the inside of the plaster surfaces and then these vines and organic leaves of the cast iron of the fascia and the columns. Uh, so this this really became with these with these Stadtbahn entrances, it became quite popular. And this group of artists and architects, they actually had their own sort of guild or society. And in 1897, Josef Albrecht was uh, given the commission to design their, uh, you, I guess we could call it their clubhouse. It's called Secessionist Hall, uh, but it, it essentially is the gallery that the secessionist artists created to exhibit their work. Uh, and here is a, a picture of Albrecht. Uh, he was another co-founder of the movement and one of its most prominent architects. Uh, he unfortunately uh, died relatively young, only in 1908, um, and uh, the secessionist movement, like the overall arts and crafts movement, did not survive you know, World War I. It was you know, that the war literally destroyed the idea of the arts and crafts movement. So here's an exterior view of the secessionist building. This was heavily damaged in World War II, uh, but has been largely restored since then. The front area uh, mostly survived. Uh, the back gallery areas that you kind of see towards the left were uh, essentially bombed uh, that and had to be rebuilt in the last few decades, but it's uh, been beautifully restored. And we see a more traditional um, exterior here, not quite the heavy curvature that we saw with even the, the Stadtbahn entrances and certainly not with uh, Gaudi's work, uh, but uh, kind of a, a mix of classical architecture with this heavy cornice line and you know a solid base uh, and uh, and then this organic ball that sits up on the top and I can tell you when I was in school and you know the, the lectures would be slides we would look at slides that the professors would put up and often the the views we would see were black and white especially of a building like this that hadn't really been restored yet and I always looked at that ball of of leaves up at the top and I thought what the heck is that it looks very weird and odd and it wasn't until I really visited it in person that uh, it, it looked better and, and you know made a lot more sense to me even 
even maybe some of my photographs here, it, it looks a bit strange, but it, it actually looks really cool in person. We can see uh, at the front entrance way here, uh, the organic uh, architecture and decoration along the sides here. It's also it almost has an, a slightly Egyptian feel to me as well to that. And the detail of this entryway with the organic leaves all across the face and, and um, the three muses here uh, representing the different aspects of art, including architecture right in the center. Here's a detail of that organic ball of leaves on the top. I'm not, I'm not really sure what it was meant for. It's certainly not a dome, uh, a classical dome. It's just a uh, decorative feature. Uh, yeah, it, uh, Marcello was asking about, it sort of reminds him of Unity Temple. And, and I think there is uh, a sense of that, if I go back a couple of slides, uh, that sort of strong geometry and these this massing, geometric massing has a certain similarity to that. And well before Unity Temple, 1897 comes uh, quite a bit before that. Uh, Unity Temple, of course, is a precast uh, or cast in place concrete structure. This is more typical framed and the exterior here is just stucco. But that simple massing and forms um, kind of predates what Frank Lloyd Wright was doing. Here's a historic view of the interior, uh, the vaulted space inside. This is one of the gallery rooms. And the walls uh, were covered in murals by Gustav Klimt, who was one of the leading proponents uh, of the artist of the secessionist style. And we'll see some examples of Klimt's work in architecture in our next example which is the Palais Stoclé, uh, which is back in Brussels. It's by a Viennese architect, Josef Hoffmann, working in the secessionist mode of things, but it's designed and built you know, for a family, the Stoclé family in Brussels. So it's kind of coming full circle uh, and, and really shows how uh, this style really spreads all across Europe. This is built uh, between 1905 and 1911, so fairly late in the uh, arts and crafts movement here on the continent. So uh, Josef Hoffman was one of the leading architects of the Viennese secessionist movement. He was uh, born in uh, Czech uh, Republic area now, which was part of the broader Austro-Hungarian empire, uh, which was destroyed, literally broken apart uh, in World War I and co-founds the secessionist movement. But in 1903, he creates an offshoot of that that was known as the Wiener Werkstatt, uh, which um, translates in English to the Vienna Workshop. And this was a uh, sort of a art, you know, arts and crafts guild that he created that would focus on uh, slightly more modern design aspects and really is a precursor to the German Bauhaus that gets uh, founded uh, just a few years, about a decade later by Gropius. And we'll be talking about it in our, in our next lecture. So this is the Wiener Werkstatt is really the, the first you know, modernist, European modernist uh, uh, school and, and workshop to be created and uh, isn't quite fully modernist the, the way the Bauhaus would be. It still has the elements of the arts and crafts movement, but it's the, uh, essentially serves as a basis for what the Bauhaus would become. So here's an exterior view of the Palais Stoclé. Uh, this is a, uh, a quite, a, it's Palais, of course, is French for palace, and that's really what this is. It's a private family home, but it, uh, they're a very, very wealthy family. And uh, so it's, it's as big as many people's palaces. And it's very private. Uh, this house has not been open to the public in many, many, many decades. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's art curators can, can get inside every so often and so forth. But um, so we know what the interiors, you know, have been well preserved, but it's sadly not accessible to people. This would be an incredible museum if it ever gets opened to the public. But you can see the exterior and we can see that transition starting to happen between the more heavily decorated, very ornamental and organic Art Nouveau movement 
to, uh, to the more modernist uh, movement that will occur in the post-World War I era. So this is in that transition moment, and, and Hoffman was a part of that transition with his Wiener Werkstatt. So the exterior does have some Art Nouveau elements, especially up here in the tower. We see some of the little bit on the railing and in almost a dome-like structure that we saw at the secessionist uh, building and these uh, bronze figures up top. But the main facades here are stripped down and almost devoid of ornamentation. Uh, and just simple window openings and only a little bit of decoration in the copper bronze uh, framing around the perimeter of the walls here. And then this is on the left here is the entry pavilion. You, you, you would roll up in your carriage at the time or maybe your horseless carriage and walk through this gallery, entrance portico gallery into the main entry facade here. Here's an aerial view. That gives you a better feel for it. and of course you can see the gardens off in the back there and here is on the left is this entry portico and gallery that leads you to the main door entry of the house and you can see this very geometric that these dormer windows become very apparent along here very geometric uh, very modern again you know devoid of the sort of extravagance of ornamentation that was characteristic of the Art Nouveau and uh, largely confined to this area here where the tower is. A few details, the uh, photos I took of the, the tower decoration, the sculptures and ornament on top. And you can see on the right the ornament that outlines the perimeter of these otherwise plain geometric forms. So you can see how this is acting as a bit of a transition between the Art Nouveau and European modernism that we'll see blossom within 10 years. In floor plan, we see the, the main ground floor plan on the bottom. Here is that entry portico pavilion that leads you into an entry vestibule and then into an entry hall which is right here just left of center h-a-l-l-e and this is a huge you might consider this a a living room i guess and it's a huge uh double story space if you look at the second floor here you see the the balcony that looks into the hall from above uh, and the staircase that's adjacent to that is this grand monumental staircase. There's a music hall. Uh, the dining room, this is um, the dining room right here, uh, is quite an extravagant space as well that I'll show you. So here is a photograph of that grand hall space or what we might call a living room looking towards the windows at the back, a bay window that looks into the gardens. Um, there's draperies pulled across, you don't really see the windows. But one of the characteristics of the Wiener Werkstatt and the early modernist movement in Europe is a use of rich materials. And we see that in this uh, beautiful marble uh, covering these piers. And even as ornamentation, sort of applied decoration and ornamentation would be stripped away of European architecture, they maintained uh, the use of rich materials throughout, and that helped to provide uh, a, a lot of design character and ornamentation, but becomes more part of the architecture rather than applied to it. So this is another early example of uh, European modernism in its, in its origins. Here are a couple of uh, historic views uh, soon after the house was built. On the right is that almost that same view in the main hall or living room with the uh, windows exposed and you can see through them, uh, you would see out to the garden. On the, on the left is a view of the entry hall and the grand staircase that leads up to the balcony up above that looking down into this great hall. And this is the dining room, uh, which is, uh, this would be, this would rival many art museum collections uh, with the rich marble uh, floor and walls, uh, the, the Hoffman designed furniture, 
which you can find in many art galleries uh, as well as in their collections. And then the walls are covered with Gustav Klimt murals. Uh, so this is this is just an incredible space, and it's really sad that the public isn't uh, given access to it. It's a very private, still privately owned. So here's a color view of that uh, more modern view showing the, the Hoffman design furniture and the Klimt murals. You're all probably pretty familiar with Gustav Klimt, a very, very famous painter. Um, see lots of posters of reproductions of his work. So here, these are pretty famous uh, paintings by him. Uh, very much in the Art Nouveau style here, we see a tree with the curving limbs and then his very abstract uh, form or human figure forms. This is one of his paintings. This is not in the Palais de Clay, but just to give you a sense of uh, this art movement of the Art Nouveau secessionist art movement of the time. Uh, you know, the rich uh, gold and gilding that he, uh, Klimt is famous for and somewhat abstracted uh, figures and they're not photorealistic figures. You can see the sort of here in the hands, especially that they're sort of uh, abstracted a little bit. His, his protege, um, uh, Egon Schiele, another Viennese artist would take that abstraction of the figure to an, an even greater extent. And of course, later artists like Picasso would abstract figures even more so. This is his most famous painting that you've all, I'm sure, have seen. Many people, you know, buy this as a poster and put them up in their dorm rooms and so forth. Uh, the Kiss by Gustav Klimt. So another Viennese architect that um, uh, is in that transition between um, uh, the Art Nouveau and early European modernism is Adolf Luce. And if you remember, I mentioned Luce in the Tribune Tower competition. He's the one who submitted the Doric column entry uh, to make the building just look like a Doric column. And that was a joke. It was, it was meant as a sort of social commentary uh, that if you want, you know, you know, he expected, rightly so, that the winning design would be some sort of historical pastiche. And so his contribution was, well, why not just make it a Doric column and be done with it? Uh, which wasn't picked, but uh, was, was really a message he was trying to send. So here's a here's an image of Luce. Um, he started out uh, in the Viennese Secession and in the Arts and Crafts movement, but soon became an outcast to the secessionists who were outcast to traditional artists and architecture as well. He uh, he believed in stripping architecture of all of its ornament. He, he began to believe that ornamentation was frivolous and was completely unnecessary and went contrary to what architecture ought to be and took that to an extreme as we'll see in a moment. Uh, he was heavily influenced by the Chicago School. He had visited the United States in the 1890s, went to Chicago and saw these newfangled high rises that architects like Barnum and Root and Sullivan and uh, Halliburton and Roche were creating, uh, which in some cases, like Sullivan, ironically, had heavy amounts of ornamentation on them. But he was influenced by the the purity of, of expression of structure and form, and and Sullivan's idea of form ever follows function, uh, and just stripped away literally the the ornamentation that many of the architects were still uh, applying to these early modern high rises. And his most famous work of, of uh, theory is uh, from 1913, a book he called Ornament and Crime, in which he literally uh, referred to the idea of adding ornamentation to architecture as a criminal act and to, to, to force craftspeople to make something that just gets applied to a building is, is a terrible way of using their, their skills. And he ironically almost uh, con uh, takes one of Louis Sullivan's uh, quotes from his writings and saying that, you know, it might be a good idea just to get rid of ornament for a few years. Uh, and so Luce takes that literally, where Sullivan didn't. He, he continued to apply even more ornamentation to his building, almost to an extreme. 
uh, uh, Luz uh, takes it literally and says, okay, I'm going to try it. Let's get rid of all ornamentation on architecture and see what happens. And this is really, he, he can be considered the first true modernist architect in which you strip away all extraneous ornamentation and just have the basic building form and structure. And we see that best at his Steiner House in Vienna from 1910. Here's an exterior view of the front. And you can see there's no ornament to the, to the building. Uh, it's not a completely plain Jane box. Uh, he actually provides a lot of visual interest on the front facade with this curving roof form and this dramatic uh, geometric dormer window that sticks out here on the front. So it has some visual interest to it, at least on the front facade, uh, but it is, it is otherwise stripped completely of any extraneous ornamentation or decoration. Now the back facade are, uh, is a little, a little less interesting a little more plain and very much of the early modernist architecture that we'll be talking about next uh, next session as well. This sets on a hillside and so the rear facade is actually three stories in height and here's a, a historic view uh, from an angle so we can see that curved roof form the edge of that curved roof form that we saw in the front and in the back it looks a lot more like maybe an apartment building uh, not a single family house and uh, you know, one can argue that the criticisms of modernist architecture uh, uh, can can kind of be seen here, and that it it doesn't really read as to, to many people as a single family home. It reads more as a just a generic uh, apartment building. Uh, his most famous work uh, is. The Luce House in Vienna, Austria. Uh, a bit of a misnomer uh, from a name standpoint. It is not actually a house. It's a commercial office building and bank, uh, but it dates from 1910. And it just became known as Luce House because it sits on a very prominent plaza in central Vienna. And it was radical. People built, the, and when, after this was built, people saw this and it stuck out so much in people's mind that they just started calling it Luce's house uh, or Luce house. And even the, the uh, Austrian emperor uh, who had his palace very close by is reported to have told his carriage driver to avoid this plaza so he didn't have to stare at this, this monstrosity of design. Uh, this, was, this was truly radical uh, for its age because it is stripped away of all ornamentation. We take that for granted now because the modernist movement really thrived in the 20th century. But this is one of the first buildings in which architecture is created and has no ornament or decoration to it. And it's not devoid, again, of visual interest. The ground floor is covered in this very beautiful green marbled uh, uh, marble, green veined marble. Uh, and it has, you know, bay windows in it. And um, it, even the cornice line has some just this little detail up here is quite interesting, but there's no dentals and classical brackets on this cornice. It's a very simple horizontal band. Uh, and the columns are about the closest thing we get to any ornamentation. They have a slight Doric order to them, uh, which of course is devoid of any uh, Corinthian order, organic nature, you know, natural ornamentation on it. Uh, but you just see this rich green marble that is exquisitely beautiful. Here's a detail from the side. Compared to the traditional architecture of the late 19th, early 20th century that we see in Vienna and, and throughout much of Europe, heavily ornamented neoclassical uh, sculptures all over the face of the building and compare that on the left to the loose house with uh, nothing but flat stucco and punched open window openings. And his uh, most famous building, or his most famous important house, is the Müller House in Prague, which is uh, in today's Czech Republic. This is pretty late in his career uh, and really shows the evolution and movement towards a modernist architecture. This dates from 1928. And we'll see some other examples of modernist European architecture from the late 20s. 
Uh, so this fits in very well with, with those examples that we'll see in the next lecture. So here again, we see a, a essentially a box or cube form with simple window openings, no decoration on it, uh, nothing that, that gives any warm, fuzzy feelings, which, you know, just to many people is a criticism of this style of architecture, but uh, it is a pure form and geometry with no other extraneous details added to it. And really an expression of Sullivan's idea of form follows function. If you need a window somewhere, you put a window somewhere. If you don't, it's the blank wall. And this is in great contrast to the Beaux-Arts architecture in which everything has to be uh, symmetrical. And if you needed a, if you didn't need a window, you still had to put that window opening. You might just put a, a blind window with a brick wall in there, but you, you, you just simply didn't have random window openings scattered about the facade like we see here in this historic photo. I love historic photos of this early modernist architecture because you see these automobiles, which were the, the you know, today look very quaint and vintage to us, but these would have been modern, you know, uh, uh, contraptions, you know, an automobile was still a pretty uh, fancy newfangled vehicle in 1928. And a more contemporary view, I got to visit this about 10 years ago. It is uh, open to the public as a house museum now, so I got a chance to go in. It sits up on a dramatic top of a hillside with a great vista of uh, the Prague Valley beyond. This is a view of the entryway and another example of, of even though there's no ornament to this, it's, it's not completely devoid of visual and design interest. He uses a travertine stone uh, to, to frame out the entrance and has a beautiful uh, entry bench located here in travertine. And I really want to use this photo as an example of, of, of reinforcing the idea that these early modernist architects, even though they didn't want you know, ornamentation and decoration, they, they realized that the lack of that meant that the details that were left were really magnified and very important. And so uh, Luz doesn't leave it to the stonemason to, to, to lay out the panels of stone. He probably worked very, very closely with them, either in design drawings or in the field, picking the stone, making sure that the veining is just the right way he wanted, and laying out the stone in ways that make this otherwise unadorned feature very decorative, very beautiful, but without any applied ornamentation. And this is a really critical thing that um, you know the other architects like Bussier and Mies van der Rohe and so forth that we'll be talking about they, they believed in heavily and, of course, gets lost in cheaper versions of modern architecture. Uh, but, you know, when you're thinking about your own design work, this is the level of detail that, you know, these architects were thinking about, you know, how to lay out the stone just right to make something quite beautiful out of this. Uh, this is a very complicated uh, interior. Uh, it's it's multi-level because it does set on the side of a hill. And uh, Luce had this, this open plan uh, design concept, very similar to what Frank Lloyd Wright had created in the United States. But whereas Wright had an open plan that was really horizontal in nature, you know, you went from room to room, they were opened up into each other and flowed both visually and physically. Rooms would flow from one to another. Uh, Luce believed in a more three-dimensional open plan so that rooms would not just be laid out on one level but would be laid out vertically as well and that openness visually and, and physically would extend vertically as well as horizontally. We saw a little bit of that you know at, at, with Hoffman at the Palais Stroclay but, but Luce fully embraced this concept and was able to, to achieve it here at Muller House because of the, the hillside setting that allowed a lot more verticality. And so in plan, on the far left is what we might call the ground floor plan, and the entrance that we just saw is right here at the center bottom of the left. And you come into an entry vestibule, but then you uh, immediately have to take a set of, you know, sort of a half flight of stairs 
to, to enter into the main hall, which is in the next uh, plan over in the back here, up near the top. This is the main hall or living room. And then that, uh, from there, you go up another half flight of steps to a dining room, which is right here. But that's opened up into visually the hall and then another half flight of steps up to a, a an office or sort of den that also looks out over the hall and dining room, and then another set of flight of stairs till you get to the bedrooms up top. It's it's very hard to visualize. This next slide shows you a section cut through that with the entry on the far right down here at the bottom, and you can see this sort of half flight up leads you on the back side here to the big hall, very tall space, and you can see there's an opening into the dining room, which is another half flight, and you can see the den space right here, which is a half flight, and that's opened up to a to a sort of second floor hallway or third floor hallway where the bedrooms are wrapped around. It's, it's a very complex planning and a sort of visual connection that is very hard to even show in photographs. I'll show you a few images and you get a sense of it, but until you really experience this space, you don't even fully realize how it works. Uh, but here's a view standing in that living room or hall. You can see some of the stairways to the right uh, and to the left. And on the left is the open dining room slightly above the level of the living room. And on this area towards the right up here at the top is a screen that screens the den that overlooks the dining or overlooks the dining room and the living room as well. So, and and we also see that rich marble work on the inside, which um, is characteristic of Luce's work. So here's another view of the living room uh, with that openness off to the right that leads into the dining room. Another historic view showing the stair area. It's, it's really just an exquisite uh, a house. And if you ever do get a chance to go to Prague, it's um, off the beaten path uh, from the main tourist area. But um, as you know, architects and designers, uh, it would be well worth your visit to, to go and visit. OK, so that finishes our lecture for today.